Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Nutritional Revolution podcast. We have a cyclist on the podcast for you today. We have Adam Roberge. He is coming to us from Quebec, Canada, Canada, and he primarily races gravel and road. He holds four national titles as well as multiple podiums in gravel and UCI road racing, and he's open to sharing his journey on YouTube and Instagram. I will say I have watched tons of his YouTube stuff and he does a really great job. And then he also hosts free weekly Zwift rides through the winter for his YouTube subscribers. So if you're not a YouTube subscriber subscriber, and you got your Zwift trainer all set up, go ahead and, and subscribe. So thank you so much, Adam, for joining us. Thank you for having me. So before we hit record here, we were trying to brainstorm with Adam, his two truths and a lie, because we put him on the spot right before we hit record. So what did you brainstorm for us, Adam, for your two truths yeah. and a lie? So, um, okay, so let's start by, I know I cannot tell you if it's a truth or a lie. So I just tell you three things. Okay. Yes. Um, <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, I eat solid food on the bike. Okay. I had a cat that had three legs. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've raised Joe Martin with a broken collarbone. Oh, okay. Joe Martin Stager. Okay, so Nia and I are going to guess which one is the lie. Don't tell us the answer because we're going to save it for the end. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to say you did not have a cat with three legs. I mean, it's possible, but I'm going with that as the lie. Maybe just cause I, oh, yeah. What are you thinking? Yeah. yeah. I was also thinking the same thing. I feel like maybe you had a different animal, maybe like a dog or something. <laughs> oh yeah. Maybe you had a dog with three legs. <laughs> That's possible. Okay. Don't tell us the answer. Um, let's go back a ways and give us a breakdown, Adam, of how you got into the world of bike racing, riding. Yeah. So um, I've been riding my bike since I'm very young. So where I, I live actually at my parents' place, uh, there's a lot of mountain bike trails around. So uh, it, it was just like super easy access. Um to me, cycling was always the thing that I really didn't want to do. So I was playing hockey in the winter and like uh, soccer in the summer. And uh, I feel like individual sports were always something I was like not happy with when I was younger. Mm -hmm. um, but my my dad would always force me to at least like it would it, he would tell me it was good for training. So I would do it just to get informed because I'd always been someone that liked to like be in great shape I knew it was paying off for the other sports but mm -hmm. cycling was always just a mix of, of training um but the more and the more I um I I got older I I kind of started realizing that actually to me at least it was easier to make the connection between effort and result in kind of an individual individual sport so um more and more, I started to train more on the mountain bike and started to enter races and stuff. So at, at 15, 16, I was pretty much just doing uh, cycling and cross-country skiing in the winter. And uh, at 19 years old, I decided to just try road racing. And it was uh, nationals because nationals were not too far from home. Mm -hmm. And I just got the perfect move and went uh, with another guy on the last lap and won nationals. So Wow. Uh, yeah, that was kind of a super easy, like fast way for me to make the transition because in, yeah. in mountain bike, I've always been pretty good, like top five in the country, but like never the best at it. And um, I don't know, with that, that enrolled, I, I kind of realized that at least to me, mountain biking can get very boring, like XCO, because you kind of know the result before the end of the race. Yeah. And like having that like surprise result just like open up to me how dynamic road was and how like possibility were pretty much infinite so yeah we just went to Europe two weeks after that that victory when I was a junior and I mean from then on I didn't touch the mountain bike until this year so oh, um, wow. I was just like yeah all in on road and uh, really liking it and um yeah, so I raced road 
professionally for five years after that that victory it was a really fast transition so it was my second year junior when i won national and i i got a pro contract the year after in the u.s so i raced in the u.s for two teams for five years and um wow. when covid happened it kind of destroyed road cycling um mm -hmm. opportunities in the u.s and gravel just kind of naturally opened up for me because uh, Pinarilu offered me a contract and uh, my road team was nice enough to make it work in 2021 so they were okay with me riding another brand mm -hmm. just on gravel mm -hmm. um, and I pretty much didn't race on the road because all race even if we were kind of out of COVID still got cancelled because of budget and stuff mm -hmm. so it just made that I did a full gravel uh, races and at this the start of this year in 2022 with all the sponsors opportunity and stuff it was just like a kind of a clear transition for me um it, it was i mean when i entered pro cycling um in the us guys were already complaining about like getting paid less and stuff and mm. when i stopped road cycling pretty much nobody was getting paid so for me it was wow a matter of like if I want to continue that like I, I I do it for fun but I also have to like live a little yes. bit so um yes um gravel was uh kind of a, a logical transition and also I always was missing and I knew that I was like I, I really like the, the the racing of road but the training of road for me um was missing the kind of a, the exploration aspect I've always been someone that really like to get lost um like in the winter i'll do like backcountry ski and just oh. uh and explore so um gravel i feel like for the last two years doing a lot of gravel um my training is is getting like more fun because oh, i can awesome. mix fun with that yeah, work so yeah great. that's great and what were some of the races you did gravel in the last year so this year I pretty much did the every everything I could. I mean I I raced like every week or every two weeks. Uh, wow. Pretty sure I, I'm the the guy that raced the most. So I I didn't I was not a lot in Canada. Mm. Um, but I, to me I take it to my advantage. Like uh, I feel like the gravel scene, a lot of the guys that are winning are towards the end of their career. Like there's new guys mm. that are now really like professional gravel racer but I think it was the first year that we saw that like all mm -hmm. the other years it was really guys that were either coming from mountain biking or coming from uh road and they were using like gravel as a kind of a retirement <laughs> yes. plan or something <laughs> yeah. um so I feel like this year was the first year that really some guys were um like putting all their their eggs into gravel and uh to me it was important to I don't have a family. I don't have a lot of things to pay. So it was important to put a lot of the budget that I had into, into the racing. So, um, yeah, it made for a busy season, but, um, I think there's a great advantage in, into knowing all the courses and knowing the races. Um, so yeah, I think next year should be even better because now, now I, I kind of know the place and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. And so, I mean, if you're racing every weekend, and I think I know the answer to this based off of the YouTube videos I've been watching, but um, are you commuting around in a van to different states? To Yeah. So, um, I mean, if so, most of the time I don't go back to Canada because it just doesn't make sense for me. Mm. Um, it's too long of a flight. I have to like do layover and stuff and it just doesn't work. So um, I'll try sometimes if I can. Um, and the, the gravel calendar is built in a way that you kind of race around the same place for a weird reason, like in a month. So there'll mm -hmm. be like three gravel races uh, around Utah and Colorado at the same time. So, um, yeah, I just stay in the area. Um, yeah, I rent a car and rent an Airbnb. But most of the time, I just find places to stay with people. So um, <laughs> this year, I've, I've stayed with like by myself in the Airbnb or hotel a few times. But last year i just couldn't afford doing that because i just had like a bike sponsor and that was pretty much all the budget for the year so i was just like going on facebook group and just like writing like to the community like does someone could host me or something so it, it kind of opened up a very cool thing that uh, i would say that half of the races the gravel races i know someone that lives there and 
that I actually have a, a great relationship with. So um, yeah, this year was just okay. like a matter of like seeing friends again. So uh, that was cool. That's awesome. Okay. So on your YouTube, you did a vlog on your nutrition for racing at Schwamigan. And I was very impressed actually by your food choices, what you were eating. Um, can you tell us a little bit of, about that? I do recall what you picked from the grocery store. Yeah, I, I kind of did. Um, most of the video this year were really focused on, on racing and like race preparation, but uh, at Trump, Trump again was a super last minute like choice for me to go there um, because I have a, a 400 kilometer close to my home. That's kind of a race that I go to because one of my sponsors is the kind of the, the, the guy that organized it. Mm. Um, but with the lifetime stuff, uh, like counting pretty much all the races and kind of the big prize money, I figured it would be a good thing to go to swim again. So it was just a last minute thing. So I didn't have a, any support or mechanic with me. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh, I might as well just do content around it. And people always ask about nutrition. So I was like, okay, I'm just as well. I'm just going to do it because I, I've never did it. It was always in the back of my mind. So I just figured let's, let's just do it like casually. I'm doing a full grocery run. So um, I guess it will be a good idea. I mean, the way I, I eat around food is different a little bit than the way I eat like all year round. Mm. Um, so maybe the the nutrition in the video is not 100% representative, but I think mm. a lot of the, the big line are uh, maybe the, the same, but the, yeah, there's for sure a little difference, I would say. Yeah. And when you like do for a race like that, when you're doing the grocery shopping, are there things you're really focusing on making sure you get? Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I'm mostly focused on, on carbs. I would say when uh, I, especially around races, I would say a big, a big difference for me. People were complaining in the video, like you have any, no vegetable. That's because I don't eat vegetable really before a race. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, I have, I will eat fruit um, because I, I just, I cannot just eat rice. I'm just mm -hmm. not that one of those guys that um, Alexei Vermeulen from Jukebox also, he just like, he will, we were at Big Sugar and he just like, tell all of us that rice is his favorite thing. And to me, like, it's okay. I like rice, but like, yeah. having like having value too if I want enough calories it is mm -hmm. important so fruit for me there is a, it, it like makes it uh, easier yeah um so yeah I would say a big thing for me is really limiting uh fiber in a way mostly mm -hmm. focusing on carbs and I'll also decrease fat because uh, if I want to take more like more carbs in I eat a little bit less fat um around races or around big weeks of training yeah yeah I mean that I I was very impressed when I saw that video I was like wow he's choosing like a good source of like multivaried carbohydrate sources and then like good like there was a bit of color in the things you were choosing so you had like your blueberries bananas like that kind of stuff. Um, I think you grabbed like a cantaloupe or something like that and had kiwis. So there was a bunch of sources too of color, but also like antioxidants. And I thought it was really great. I was like, this guy knows what he's doing. So, but you were just kind of winging it, you think, or going off of like what's worked for you in the past. I, I just think I really like the taste. So that's, that's a thing. Um, and like I say, I feel like, it, especially when you're eating clean, it's, hard sometimes to have enough calories so if i can include a lot of variety for me it makes it easier um i mean yeah i, I feel like i'm kind of someone that has a little bit of trouble being not strict about my diet so i'm kind of strict about what i eat and i know a lot of racers that um they'll just eat everything and it works great for them because they can actually eat enough you know um but for me i know that if i want to eat enough variety is uh, is important that's why i know that just rice doesn't work so i like in terms of carbs i need rice potatoes uh, oats and also a lot of fruit if i want to get uh, enough uh, calories in so um yeah and it, it just happened that there is a lot of colors and and those fruit just may, mostly because of a, a i guess a, a taste tasting mm -hmm. that i can eat enough but yeah in the back of my mind you know that having variety is probably helpful yeah 
Yeah. I, I mean, I think that's excellent. And then I saw too, you chose a couple of different fermented foods as well. Probiotic mm-hmm. rich foods. Like you had keeper yep. sauerkraut and I think kombucha in there. Yep. Are yep. those a regular thing in your diet or have you noticed? Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I think, help? yeah. People argue about a lot of things in nutrition, but I feel like if there's one thing that's kind of accepted, that's good for their gut, it's ferment and food. So mm-hmm. I, um, yeah, so for me, it's kind of a no-brainer. If everybody agrees on something or almost everybody agrees on something in nutrition, I feel like I'll, I'll do it. Um, so uh, yeah, yeah, um, that that was for sure intentional. And uh, um, yeah, I, I, I just feel also for me, just nutrition is kind of a way to like stabilize my environment a little bit. So I'm always in hotel room or Airbnbs or at people places yeah. and like uh, nutrition is kind of the only way I have like to uh, kind of feel home a little bit. So uh, mm-hmm. um, those, yeah, um, those things are for sure something like if, if you would tell somebody, maybe they wouldn't understand why, why do you buy this? It's just for three days. You don't really need like those fermented food for three days. Just like focus on simple. And I've done that on the road, on the road, you don't decide what you eat. So that okay. that's just what you do. But um, having more of that routine in terms of nutrition and eating a little bit of the same thing that are no are good for me. Um, I do it because I'm on the road five months out of 12 or five. Like, yeah. So like half of the year, pretty much. So if I want to eat good, I also have to include those, those stuff around the races. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's important. I mean, I think it can be easy for people when they're traveling a lot to rely on I don't know, fast food or, you yeah, know, or just eating out in restaurant and stuff. And, um, that's kind of what you do when you start, um, mm-hmm. you go out a lot. And after that, you realize how much like energy you're wasting. And that's like, it's great to go out. I feel like if there is a, like a, like socialization opportunity attached to it. So for me, it's worth it in that case. Yeah. But like, if I'm just gonna go out, go out and eat something that it's not really worth the price and, uh, I feel like I don't have enough or it's not really what I want to eat. Like eating is a big part of training and uh, I appreciate it a lot. And to me, like this 30 or 40 bucks a day, it's really expensive, but I don't have near enough, like the quality uh, if I eat out, you know? So right. um, yeah, I just feel like uh, it's worth it to do a gr- good grocery. if Even if I'm not going to be there for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's great. Do you, you mentioned like Airbnbs and, um, do you have like a travel van that you use to get around or? No. So most of the time, I mean, so, so at the bigger races, I had a mechanic that, Mm -hmm. uh, like had the, he was actually driving there, uh, with the bikes and, uh, would get there in advance and we would use his, uh, yeah, the car with a trailer. Um, so that was kind of the setup. Mm. Um, like I say, I would say that almost half of the races now I know people to stay with, so they have a car and it makes it easier. Um, so, uh, or, or the other time I'll just rent a car. Um, yeah, my girlfriend is still living here in Gatineau. So the van life is maybe something we would explore later. Hopefully we'll see. (laughs) Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, some of those vans have like little kitchens in them and stuff and you could. Yeah. Some guys have great setup for sure. I mean, it's a lot of driving. You would, yeah, you need to be at least two in like, I couldn't do that by myself. It wouldn't make sense. It's too much driving, but uh, yeah, yeah, if you're two or three people, then it could work. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. So, um, talking about carbs and all these real food carbs, it makes me think about carb loading leading up to an event. Do you, is that something you kind of think about at all? Or do you just naturally try and increase your carbs? Or are you trying to hit a specific target? Or what does that look like for you in the lead up to a race? Um, I, I, so I would say it's, it's, it's not that I eat more, it's maybe just a shift in, um, in like uh, like a little bit more the percentage is more carbs than it would mm. be fat and protein like mm. it's less uh, yeah um in terms of total calorie it's probably a little bit the same mm-hmm. I, I don't think i eat that much more especially that before races you train less mm-hmm. so um yeah. I, I wouldn't say i eat more um but i would i switch a little bit how much like the, the amount of each uh of protein, fat, and and carbs. It's mostly just a 
like to a little bit more towards carbs than mm -hmm. it would normally be. Yeah. Nice. And then, um, do you have like a favorite go-to pre like race morning breakfast that you like to do? Um, I eat, so I'll, I'll just get fruit and, and rice. I like to me oats, I'll eat it sometimes, but I don't really like it. So rice mm -hmm. is just easier for me. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of what I do. I just keep it simple and, uh, yeah, I I mean at the day of the race, like to me it's uh I, I don't worry about eating like enough. Like if I've eaten enough the, the day leading to the races, I just do a normal breakfast, kind of what I would do at a race. I just make sure to like eat my breakfast and continue eating until the race. I think that's a big thing, but mm -hmm. I don't eat a bigger breakfast than I would uh, otherwise. I yeah, I a race is not, and I think mountain biker are very different than road racer in that case. Mm -hmm. uh, mountain biker, like it's all about how, like, how, like what can I change around a race? But on the road, you race so much that um, it kind of desensitizes you to what a race is in a bit because mm -hmm. you race like sixty days during the year or ninety days during the year. So wow. Um, now that I'm doing more gravel, you. Yeah, you put more emphasis, maybe a little bit around the race, how you you do things. But to me, it's just another day. I don't really. It's just a hard training ride, you know. I'll prepare. Yeah. I'll do probably the same thing if I have a big block coming up on in, on the weekend. Mm -hmm. Probably gonna be the exact thing that I do before a big race. Yeah, that's great. I mean, it means you are also familiar with it too, right? Yeah. It's not mm -hmm. something new to your system. Um, with kind of thinking about fueling in gravel. I know I see a lot of people now with like the vests with nutrition in it. How do you carry or plan your nutrition hydration for during a race? So I use those like uh, 850 millimeters, like monster bottle that I have. And mm -hmm. uh, I have like, depending on the feed zones, uh, I'll have either three or four with me so I, I i never race with the hydration pack uh to me it's just like yeah yeah i just don't think it's it's worth the extra heat the extra mm -hmm. like aero penalty that you get mm -hmm. and i mean if you calculate like two so most most guys they'll race no not most guys but guys that race with the a pack on so they'll have like two liters at the back or 1.5 liters at the back and they'll have like two bottles of 500 so that like that's approximately like 2.5 or 3 liters on them mm -hmm. but it, if I can do 850 times four like I'm I'm pretty much at the same quantity and uh, I just like it way better than having a pack on um, yeah yeah for aero for comfort for heat um so yeah that that's what I do and most of the time having close to three liters on you it is enough to get to the next feed zone or get to the finish yeah yeah have you ever like lost a bottle in racing yeah you, yeah yeah you I mean so I have really really good um silica bottle cage holder mm -hmm. that uh, you can actually like uh put tighter so they're, oh, they're kind nice. of the, they look like uh a old bottle cage but rather than being in uh, like uh, in aluminium or mm -hmm. uh, they are in titanium so you can actually like they're malleable they're not like carbon mm -hmm. so um yeah i even i have one on the the bottom of my frame and i never never lose it i would say try to remember if i lose a bottle this year i, I don't i don't remember losing a bottle this year so that's uh, great yeah i mean you have to be careful when you're changing the bottles around so yeah. that's, that's kind of the thing. You got to make sure you're on a smooth surface when you do that. Yes. But it's the only time uh, that I really worry about losing bottles. Yeah. That's great. Wow. And um, what do you like with your bottles? Do you put just hydration in there or do you put fuel in your bottle or how do you like to yeah, go about so, that? Uh, so I changed that and I, I'm not sure exactly if it's good still, oh, but it shoot. works really good for, yeah. I've done that for the last, four races and I okay. mean my end of the season was very good okay um so the way I do it uh now before I used to just have a like infinite gel in my mm. back yeah um but now 
so I do, I have the three big bottles, like one in my back or two in my back is, if it's really, really hot or mm -hmm. the feed zone, there's not a lot of feed zone. So one or two bottles in my back, I have three bottles on my frame, mm. but one of those bottles is just maple syrup with uh, salt. Oh, nice. Yeah. Do you so make that bottles, yourself or is yeah, that the untapped um, product? No, that's not Ted. Ted, Ted I mean, Ted, if you want to spare. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I would monster. I cannot have someone else. But, um, okay, gotcha, anyway, gotcha. anyway Ted, Ted, Ted knows that. He knows that maple syrup from Canada is way better. But um, <laughs> we always have an argument with that. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Um, That's funny. I mean, if they can source the maple syrup in Canada, maybe we'll, we'll chat. But, yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> no, but so I put um, just like normal hydration in the bottles. Mm -hmm. So I'll still have a little bit of sugar in the bottles. Mm -hmm. So it will be just a normal hydration uh, solution. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, at the back, the bottle at the back is maple syrup with just a little bit of water to make it a little bit more uh, like the, the right texture. Like, so it's approximately a bottle of 850 uh, millimeters of, of uh, maple syrup with just a little bit of water is approximately six to 500 grams of carbs. Wow. Um, so I have, uh, so at big sugar, for example, that was at like 130 grams of carbs per hour wow. with the bottles. So yeah. um, I guess it works great for me. I don't get tired of the taste. Yeah. And uh, it seems to be one of the only way I can have enough, like have that much calories. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I've been, like I said, I'm not telling everybody is the way I'm going to do it for a long time. I've been doing that for the last three years, races, and it, it worked very good. Yeah. So um yeah, we'll see. And it's really the, the good thing is that is really less um like there's a when you buy gels, first of all, they're super expensive, but also mm -hmm. like you dispose of so much gels, like it, it would like it, it's crazy. In a six hour yeah. race, it's like if you want to have that much carbs, it's like five an hour. Mm -hmm. Um I mean it's it's so five or six gels an hour, it's so much gel. So yeah, um, I really like also the, that aspect of of just it makes it more simple and really mm -hmm. better I guess for uh, all the waste yeah definitely better for the mm -hmm. environment for sure yeah so mm -hmm. with when you mentioned sodium are you have you done any sweat sodium testing or do you alter your no. you just so I've go by never feeling? yeah so um yeah that's something that I want to explore more um the amount of sodium I can ingest before a race and stuff like that um mm -hmm. I think that's for sure a, 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 an area uh where i'm lacking so I, i'm actually reading a, a book on that right now and uh, try to see maybe next year or I'll, I'll try it on long ride how much can i push salt yeah um also in, in preparation for the race um mm -hmm. so yeah that's uh, i'm experimenting a little bit right now how much salt i can put in that maple syrup bottle to see yeah the, what i can handle uh, with my my gut and stuff but mm -hmm. it seems like it's a it could help yeah so um yeah. yeah what's the book you're reading if you want do you want to share it it's it's just called win i don't remember the the name of the author it's just, okay uh, it's it's uh, it's not really a i could yeah it's called win it's a really weird like boring name but uh, it's all about salt uh, oh interesting salt and okay. yeah yeah Cool. Well, we can link that in the sh the show yeah, notes. Sure. Um, have you done any weighing pre and post? You're like so. That yeah, I, when I was racing on the road, we would do that a lot. And uh, I mean, I have never been someone that was like my weight was um, changing a lot. It mm -hmm. was kind of like you were I don't able know to if I always it. been good to eat a lot on the bike or drink a lot. I think yeah, I think I've always been good at that um, to. Um, yeah have a high calorie intake on the bike mm -hmm. so yeah I would lose like we would go for a six hour ride some guys would lose like seven or eight pounds and I would lose like two pounds so, oh wow um, yeah 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 That's so good. um yeah so you're, you're I, I don't know uh -huh. um I seem to be yeah I don't know if it's maybe I should sweat more I don't know <laughs> <laughs> I think definitely like we're seeing there's such a individual component to fluid mm -hmm. losses and then you know environmental conditions too like I've 
have a sweat tested with a client. He was losing, I think 135 ounces in an hour in only 65 degrees. So like if he went to like Kona or something, he would be that that's yeah, 135 that's ounces, I think is four liters, right? Like, yeah, no, I mean, yeah, it's, it's and, insane. Uh-huh. But the thing is that I don't sweat a lot, but I'm not very good in the heat. Mm. So I, I, I like, it does it like, so to me, it doesn't make sense because technically I should be good because I don't lose that much water, but I don't know. I don't yeah, but know. Maybe I, I, I still need to figure out yeah. to, to cool yourself. Yeah, exactly. I, I yeah. need to figure out the, the heat thing for, for sure. That's a, yeah, I think for I, I, most of my training is not in super hot condition. And the races that I always struggle more is like crazy heat. And mm-hmm. in the US, we have a lot of them like uh, over 90. So mm-hmm. um, yeah, that's uh, that's still something I'm str- like. Maybe it's the sort, Canadian blood. <laughs> yeah, I guess when it's cold, I love it. I yeah. feel like I, I have 30 watts more or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Have you done any talking about that? Any like sauna protocol exposure? Yeah, so that that helped. So uh, yeah, so before a big race, I'll that I'll do that for sure. Mm-hmm. I do um, hot exposure pretty much always, mm-hmm. um, but I'll like so the the be leading up to big races like that it's hot. Um, maybe I'll try to be around that climate and also do hot exposure because it's something like to me. Like to me, I, I do sauna and hot bath here, but like it's I train in minus five right now, you know. Oh, so like maybe maybe I have a little bit of hot exposure after the training, but it's wow. nowhere near the long hot exposure I would have if I do a five hour ride in Tucson and then come back and go in the hot, you know. Yeah. So I feel like it's probably not enough just to do the hot exposure if I don't train in the hot also, mm-hmm. and and I can see a difference like. So the, the there's races in Texas in May, mm-hmm. and uh, I I start to get used to the heat a little bit in May because I, I I rode other races, but I'm still mostly training here. And in May, the weather in in Fahrenheit is probably like sixty around mm-hmm. sixty sixty five. Yeah, and I just know it's not enough. Like I cannot go from sixty five straight to Texas at one hundred in May. Right. Like the first race is going to be very bad. Like for yeah. me, I can do a, as much hot exposure as I want. <laughs> it, the first race is not going to be good. You know, yeah. so like last year we went to Big Bend and there was a race around like around there, a Red Bull race. And mm. after the race, we just rode two weeks in the crazy hot condition. And the race after, like I was like, ah, like now 100 doesn't feel crazy, crazy yeah. bad. Yeah. So wow. I feel just, yeah. And also mentally getting used to that crazy heat and stuff. Definitely. Also, is it? Yeah. Are you at altitude at all? Where you live in Canada? No, I'm in like no. No, shoot. So you don't get any altitude. Yeah, Yeah, I don't don't get. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Maybe when, maybe when my girlfriend's gonna be able to. She does. She's doing our doctorate, so we're kind of stuck here. Oh wow. uh, Maybe I'll convince her uh, after that to go live. uh, in altitude somewhere in the yeah, states go, for, for go to Colorado or something yeah exactly yeah yeah because it yeah it's like half of the rays are in altitude and the other half is in the heat so like mm-hmm. um yeah if, like I'm yeah I'm for sure losing a little bit in that because I can clearly see that when it's sea level and it's mm-hmm. cold like it's, it's hard for me to do a bad race you know uh, yeah, yeah yeah I I had a client like that they they the cold was their there was that mm-hmm. was their jam they did well mm-hmm. <laughs> in cold. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um and it makes sense i mean we tend to have a better ability to control our core temperature and we you know don't need maybe nearly as much fluids mm-hmm. and all that stuff so so why don't we just be mindful of your time i will um we'll kind of start to tie things up here so what's kind of next for you on racing you're in postseason right now for a little bit yeah yeah it's off season right now uh i've took two weeks kind of of the bike just like doing cross-country skiing and running winter Mm -hmm. came like super early here Mm -hmm. so I was able to do cross-country ski um and the way I do my off season I really do it in a way that's like the easiest for me so Mm -hmm. um right now I'm like uh so I'm back to training pretty much fully but no intensity so I just ride a lot at low Mm -hmm. intensity pretty much I'll do one day of intensity during the week just to like maintain a little bit 
Mm-hmm. And during uh, Christmas, like all around Christmas, I, I'm also just like pretty much not touching the bike, just doing yeah. cross-country skiing and being very flexible nice. with my schedule. And when Christmas is done, that's when the real, like real training happened leading yeah. out to, uh, to, to, the, to next year. Yeah. 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 What's your first race on the calendar for next year? Um, I'll probably do a little bit of preparation races, like some smaller gravel mm. races, um, depending on where I do a training camp, just mm-hmm. to let, get the leg speed on. So, so my training, the way I structure it in the winter, when I'm home, I do like three or four days of just like volume outside. So it will either be, um, cross country skiing, mm. um, or fat biking. Mm-hmm. So I oh, do fun. like, yeah, <laughs> so I do like 20 hours normally outside and i'll do mm-hmm. like the five or six hours the extra on the trainer mm. um so I, I really my so i don't really have a plan that's super structure it's really i i kind of decide in the winter because fat biking you really you're really a slave to the condition so um if it's not good condition you cannot just ride outside so right if it's amazing condition and i have a six hours and tomorrow or the day after I'm going to do the six hour now because mm-hmm. if not I'm just losing on it on an amazing day outside and we don't right. have any light here like right now it's like 4 p.m and the sun has been down for like three hours you know oh, two wow. hours so um you have to wake up early and yeah go as much take as much sun as you want because yes. if not you're going to feel it uh, mentally but that yeah. being said, because I do so much fat bike and so much cross country skiing, it takes me one or two preparation races to get the the, mm. the the racing legs back. I always see it like I'm in great form, but fat biking I average like maximum eight miles and like eight miles an hour or seven miles an hour. Wow. So just having that leg speed back um, is is needed. So I, mm. I, I I'll do some preparation races like it. In February, I'm not sure where it depends where I do my training camp. Yeah, just to make sure I or a big group rides or stuff like that. Yeah, awesome. And let's see, where can people find you, follow you, YouTube, all that stuff? Yeah, um, I mean, YouTube is more um in detail. So like, mm-hmm. yeah, I feel like people that follow me in, in YouTube are very interested or actually interested in what I do. Um. And if not, uh, I have like every everybody else. I have uh, Instagram, Facebook, and stuff. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, try to I try to keep it that good content. Like to me, I feel like uh, I have a problem with social media in a way that I know that I can get very addicted to it. So I don't. Um, it's a weird thing to me because I, I my job includes social media. And it's a valuable thing, like to for 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 my job but also i i know the downside of it so i'm always like on the on this on hesitating about encouraging people to pass more time on social yeah but yeah i I would feel like to have really your time worth i would go to youtube first yeah Yeah. i feel the content would be more quality Uh, unless you really want to see everything that i do day to day like where I am and stuff and you're really interested and you feel that that that's adding value to your life then Instagram is probably that place and if you want to just copy my training it everything is on Strava but don't oh, call wow. me if you're over training <laughs> exactly yeah <laughs> and we'll we'll link your YouTube and Instagram on the show notes for sure um and do you do all the editing of your own videos yeah I do um wow. yeah so um I I I like it because that's that passed the time in the plane. So mm. there is no video that I've been edited on the ground. They're all yeah. been editing uh, wow. in the plane. So uh, that's kind of why impressive. sometimes in the off season, I have less video uploaded because mm. I just cannot find the time. I feel like unless I'm yeah. in a plane, because in a plane, I don't have any Wi-Fi and stuff. So like, it's a great excuse to just edit a video. Yeah. Um. So yeah. Um. Yeah. I've been enjoying it. I think it's a uh, it's not maybe so professional the way I did, but I, I kind of enjoy the process of the storytelling stuff. So yeah, I, I enjoy your videos. I think you do, I mean, way better job than I, I could ever do. <laughs> so I, I thought they were professionally done. So yeah, you're doing a good job. Thank um, you. So before we finish up here, we have to reveal your lie. So 
Um, you told us that you only eat solid food on the bike, which I think we realized maybe that's the lie. Cause you told us you do maple syrup in your bottle. You said you had a cat with three legs. I I'm surprised if that's going to be true. And then you said you raced Joe Martin with a broken collarbone. So which one was the lie? Uh, the, 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 the was there a lie in that? <laughs> Are they all true? <laughs> you have a cat with three legs? No, they're all true. Oh, <laughs> Oh my god! I didn't tell a lie. They're all well, true. I'm sorry. But you don't. No way you don't you eat solid. <laughs> but you don't. Do you eat solid food on the bike right now or no? No, no, I don't. Okay, so that's your lie. Okay, that was a lie. What did I say? I say I eat only liquid solid. food, or I I say I eat solid food. Yeah, that's what you said. Okay, so, so then yeah, that was my lie. lie. Okay, you did okay, it right. Okay. Yeah, so that was my yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> right. yeah yeah yeah. No, I don't eat solid food on the yeah. bike since uh, like six months. Wow. Yeah, I've been okay. trying that. Yeah. See, you did it right. You did it right. Yeah. So awesome. I was okay. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you again so much for joining us, Adam. This was wonderful to speak with you and learn some nuggets of your fueling. And I love all the real food choices you make when you're on the road like that. So I think this was great for our listeners. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It was great.